coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. Jesus came, in other words, sent by the Father to restore broken man, broken humanity back to the Father, connect us back to life so that he could resurrect our dead souls, give us a new spirit, the Spirit of God, and we could start having life. And then life can come out of us, emanate out of our spirit, man, through the Word of God and start producing life in our lives and around us. And then we can start spreading that life into other people people who are lost. This is how it's supposed to operate. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery. We're bringing you a brand new word. It's entitled, The Walking Dead. Literally, that's in the Word of God. I want you to get out scriptures. Go with me, and let's hear the first part of this message, The Walking Dead. Genesis 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge... Of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die God said not just die he said you will surely die in the day that you eat of it so God warned Adam not to eat of the tree of knowledge or he would die yet we see in Genesis 3 after both he and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit they were still alive <laughs> in the day that you eat it you shall surely die but after they were, had partaken, they were still alive. On the surface, at this point in Adam and Eve's encounter with sin, it appears that God was wrong and that Satan was correct when he said to Eve, Satan did, the serpent, uh, God knows that you will not surely die, but you will be like him. So on the surface, it appears like God was wrong and Satan was correct. This is the deceptive part of sin. Well, God has set y'all up today. People indulge in all types of sin, do they not? Do we not? <laughs> but, but realize that they're still living after they have willingly committed sin against the Lord. It's not that God lied. God didn't mean they would die literally but they would become dead souls after committing sin in their hearts to him. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, they became the walking dead. Sin had made them and all mankind dead to God, separated us from his life. It's only after someone dies in their sin that they will know that God was absolutely correct and Satan was certainly wrong and deceived them. But by then, it'll be too late. That's the sad part of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. We see from this example how truly deceptive sin is once it enters a person's heart. It's deceptive because it is based on a lie. Satan lied to Eve, did he not? It was, sin was based on a lie, and the lie that is believed becomes, listen to me very carefully, when you believe a lie, it becomes spiritual darkness to the one who believes the lie. It blinds people who are lost to their need for God, their need for Jesus, and their need for salvation. Adam didn't see the need to confess his sin to God, even though God asked him if he had sin or partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was walking in spiritual blindness. It's so sad to realize what it means for a person to be lost, to be spiritually dead to God because of the sin in their heart. Not only has sin blinded them to their sin, but it also blinds them through spiritual blindness to the need to be saved. Jesus is speaking in the Gospels. He says, if that light which in, is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Once Satan has his talons in a person's soul through sin, he gives them no hope of ever escaping. Now let's, let's slow down for a moment. Whenever Adam and Eve sin, 
they believed that lie. They took that lie in. That lie blinded them. They were walking now in spiritual darkness. And when God called them on their sin, they acted as though they were not even sinners because sin had blinded them to their own sin. Now, what do you think about a person who feels like they're okay? And you talk to people. I ask people all the time, how are you spiritually? I'm fine. I'm okay. And it's like, the lights aren't even on. How can you be okay? And, and it's sad because Satan has them in his prison with no mercy and no hope of ever escaping. But God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul's writing there, and he says in verse 3, But if our uh, gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing or lost. Whose minds the God of this world has what? So he, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded those who do not believe the gospel. So they have sin in their hearts, and they're blinded spiritually in their minds because they're not believing the gospel, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. Since Satan has sinners blinded, they fail to see the relevance or significance of the gospel when it is presented to them. That's why whenever you go out and you share your faith with others and, and you share what Christ has done in your life for them and you share what truth is because they're dealing with sin in their life, they look at you like you're the one that's from another planet. And it's because the enemy has blinded them. They don't realize they have sin. And when you tell them they have sin because they don't see it as sin, they see you as judging them. So they don't see the relevance or the significance of the gospel being presented to them. If sin has blinded them to their sin, then they see no need to be preached to about salvation from sin. That sounds to me like a hopeless situation. But if they should choose to believe the gospel, then the light of the truth could shine in their hearts and will shine in their hearts to reveal the sin that spirit, the spiritual blindness that sinners have can reveal to them the sin in their heart. They would see their need for Christ at that point. So what we must do is pray that God will shine a light in people's hearts, that they will begin seeing sin as sin. And that they will once again experience and know what conviction through the Holy Spirit is. And they begin to be convicted. Where is conviction? You hardly ever hear that word. You ever hardly hear about somebody falling under the power of conviction. Do you not? I'm a pastor, and I almost never hear that word being used out of people's lips. I fell under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He revealed to me I had sin in my heart, and if I were to die, I would go straight to hell, and it would be sin and not God that sent me there. But where is the convicting power of God in the world today? Romans chapter 5, please. Romans 5, verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for who? The ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if... When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God is so clever. He knew that Satan would use sin to blind us spiritually. God also knew that sin would produce death in us and in our lives. 
Once death begins to invade the physical life of a sinner, the physical realm of a sinner, they can begin to become broken and start searching for solutions for their problems. This is so good because after I have just painted you this dismal, bleak picture of how Satan has people who are in sin and, and are literally dying spiritually on the vine, have them with no hope of ever escaping that, that prison of sin and bondage to sin, now God is showing us that when sin comes in, it produces death in the, the sinner, does it not? But the thing is, if, if the, the vine is death, has death in it, then the branches are going to have death. That means what's death inside will start manif manifesting outside of them. Now, you might say this is a bad thing, but it really isn't because once death starts coming into a person's life and they start, start experiencing their world falling apart, it can cause them to become broken in their heart and they will start reaching out trying to find solutions to fix their problem. Now, because it is a spiritual problem and they are spiritually blind to spiritual problems, they will think that it is a soulish or a temporal problem that needs to be fixed with counseling or medication or whatever the case may be but really what that will do is it will cause them to start reaching out at least at that point somebody has an opportunity to come and share the love of Christ and give them the opportunity to say hey wait a minute I've got a remedy for this situation Amen. having said that turn with me to Galatians chapter 6 One scripture there, one verse, Paul writes in Galatians 6, 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap what? Corruption or ruin. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap what? Everlasting life. So if we sow to our flesh, even as sinners sow to their flesh, they will reap corruption. If we as Christians sow only to our flesh, we will reap corruption or decay or ruin, correct? But if we sow our lives to the Spirit, not the temporal but the eternal, then we will start reaping of the Spirit everlasting life, will we not? Jesus, when He came to earth, He didn't come as our judge to condemn us because of our sin. Thank God for that. But He came to save us from our sin. John 3.17 tells us this, does it not? He did this by ministering to the physical needs as well as the spiritual needs of the lost so that they could have the opportunity to believe in Him as the Son of God. It says, He went about doing good, healing sick, all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. That's what Jesus came to do, to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to give blind, uh, sight to the blind. But through that ministry, he would be given the opportunity to reach them where they're at in their spiritual blindness and let them see the light that was in them and on, I mean on him and in him so that they could be drawn to the light through the love. It was the love that Christ had for sinners. He, he didn't treat sinners the way the self-righteous religious crowd did. He ate with publicans, uh, tax collectors, and sinners, did he not? And then he was ri ridiculed, publicly berated by the uh, zealots, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the, and the Sadducees because he ate, had fellowship with the sinners. Now Paul addresses, says, uh, if, if a brother is in sin, then don't have any fellowship with him. But he says, I do not say don't have fellowship with in, everybody that has sin because the, then you wouldn't be able to eat with anybody at any time. What he was saying is, it's fine to eat with sinners as long as you are bringing them up where you're at and they're not bringing you down. Where, but if you, if you have a brother or a sister who is in blatant sin, then do not have fellowship with them because what you're doing is condoning them in their sin and they know better, unlike a sinner who is blind to their sin. Now, once a sinner believes in Jesus as God's only begotten Son, the light of truth enters their heart, and then the life of God resurrects them from the dead. Now, Paul teaches us what happens to humans when we sow only to our flesh and never address our spiritual needs. 
As someone sows to their flesh, they will of the flesh begin to reap corruption, decay, and ruin. In other words, death will begin to grip their lives and they will begin to experience severe problems that only God can fix. But this is a good thing. James tells us when lust is conceived, it produces sin. When sin is full grown, it will produce what? Death. As sinners begin to see the manifestation of death in their lives, their world falling apart, in other words, this can cause them to begin seeking help. Jesus is the only one who can rid a sinner of their sin and the death that has been brought upon their lives because of their sin. Having said that, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, verse 16, this is the account where Jesus goes into the temple and he is going to minister after they give him the book of Isaiah. And he ministers out of that book. In verse 16 it says, So he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a messianic prophecy in Isaiah's book that is foretelling the coming of the Messiah, and Jesus is their Messiah. And so he's reading this as their Messiah about the Messiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you see condemnation in any of that? No. There is absolutely nothing but love, liberation, and freedom from sin and the bondage to sin, and the repercussions are the fruit of sin, correct? Correct. That is mentioned in there. Jesus came, in other words, sent by the Father to restore broken man, broken humanity back to the Father, connect us back to life so that he could resurrect our dead souls, give us a new spirit, the Spirit of God, and we could start having life. And then life can come out of us, emanate out of our spirit, man, through the Word of God and start producing life in our lives and around us. And then we can start spreading that life into other people who are lost. This is how it's supposed to operate. So God anointed Jesus with his power to restore everything in people's lives that sin and Satan had ruined. Jesus didn't have to go around pointing out people's sin. You're a sinner. I know what you did. But he did walk around Israel supplying the needs of the Jews who had been devastated by sin and the fruit of their sin, which was death. Through his love and through his goodness towards sinners, they were able to see their need for a Savior and that Jesus was the one and the only one who saves. By doing this, this is what's so clever about God. By doing this, God took what Satan meant for evil in the Garden of Eden and turned it around for all of Fallen humanity's good. You've got death in you. You have sin in you. You're spiritually blind and you don't even know it. But now your life has fallen apart. Your world has fallen apart. And I'm here to minister to your needs. What do you need? Wow. And then he starts doing that. And he starts loving you. And he starts healing things that's broken in your life. And it opens them up to the need for a Savior. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going somewhere. Verse 1. And you, that's us, all of us, he Christ made what? Made us alive who were what? dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So we were dead and we were walking. We were dead people 
walking in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He was dictating to us what we would and would not do. The spirit who now works in the son of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath just as the others. But God... See, he comes in right in the nick of time, does he not? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together. Not only made us alive, but now he has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches. See, here's why God not only, yes, you needed eternal life, all people do, but it's more than that. God wants to make an example out of you of his goodness to the world. I'm a child of the king now. I'm a child of the creator, God. I am re reconciled back to God, and now I can allow his goodness, his kindness to flow through my life so that you can see as a sinner how great my father really is, how good he is, and how much he loves people because he loved me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of your works, not of yourself. It is a gift of God. We who are in Christ used to be the walking dead. We were blinded by the God of this world, but God who is rich in mercy, according to Paul there, sought us out and saved us. Jesus says, you did not choose me, I chose you. If you are born again, then God has literally raised you from the dead. You've had a resurrection in your life. Isn't that powerful? Every one of us that are born again have been resurrected from the dead. We've been raised up from the dead. Wow. Next time you go into the supermarket or go out to whatever, and you say, have you ever seen somebody that has come back from the dead? They'll say, no. He say, well, you're looking at somebody. I was dead, but now I'm alive. That is resurrection. God has raised us literally from the dead. You weren't dead in the natural, but you were dead at 4 o'clock in the morning spiritually. Didn't Jesus tell Nicodemus in John 3 that we must be what? Born again. If we have to be born again to see and enter the kingdom of heaven, then that means that we were dead. But how can we be dead and yet still be alive? What if Adam and Eve had known in the garden what we know right now? That they were, they were dead. And they did have sin because they had sin. They had committed it. But they were blind to that. They thought, nothing happened. I'm good. But then their son rose up and killed their other son. Wow. Sin brings death. Point me to John chapter 11, please. I'd been seeking the Lord the last couple of days about what he wanted me to preach on. And last night he opened this up to me. He said, I want you to teach out of Lazarus' story. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and Martha, her sister Martha, and it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, I want you to take a moment and meditate on what Jesus just said. He says, this sickness that Lazarus is experiencing is not unto death, but the purpose of this sickness that he has right now is that God may receive glory, but that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So this story is very significant in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
because through this story, through this experience, through this testimony of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, through it, Jesus is going to be glorified. Now, this is powerful. So let's dig into it and see what the Spirit is saying. Jesus wasn't mincing words when he told the disciples that Lazarus' sickness was not unto death, but it was for the glory of God. God was about to use this one miracle. Out of all the miracles that Jesus did here on earth, God was going to use this miracle, a miracle which would involve raising someone from the dead. He had raised other people from the dead. But this individual had been dead for four days. Through this miracle, the Lord was going to have people throughout the region talking about the resurrection from the dead, and he raised Lazarus as a proof to the Jews. Now, mind you, this is not long before Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and, and where they greet him and say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they begin to lay palm branches before him as he rides into Jerusalem on this donkey. And now we call that Palm Sunday and we celebrate that. But this story is not very long before that. And it was this story that changed everything spiritually in Jerusalem from that moment forward. Let me explain. When God says, I'm going to do something on the earth, that is new. He was literally doing that through the resurrection of Lazarus. This was so key and pivotal to who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do that when he was literally raised from the dead, there was a, it was like a, a spiritual explosion that took place in all of Jerusalem and people began to be sw sworn, uh, started coming to Christ before I leave you today, I want to thank you so much for joining us and listening to the first part of this message. Be sure and tune in next week for the powerful conclusion. This was the introduction to the sermon, but the powerful conclusion is coming up next week on this station at this time. Be sure and stay tuned for that. As I get ready to leave you today, I want to encourage you, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, we'd love to hear those from you. You can contact us at the church office or you can send us an email, prayer at whcnorth.org. As always, I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, if you've been watching this ministry for a while and you know that we're a ministry of integrity, that I use the Word of God to back up everything I teach, then I want to encourage you to go that next step and become a contributor and help us reach the nations of the world for the glory of God. You can do that safely and securely on our website. The website is www.whcnorth.org. Uh, you can give either through PayPal or through Givelify app, which you can download on your phone or uh, device. And everything that you give is tax deductible and goes straight to the television ministry. As I get ready to leave you today, I want to encourage you in the days that we're living in, please keep your eyes on the Lord and off the storm and let God give you victory in your life. God bless you.